Okay, well, good morning, everybody. I'm happy to see all these faces bright and early. Hopefully the after, after, after parties didn't keep you out too late and you made it here. To those of you that went, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks for showing up. So yeah, we're excited to be here at DrupalCon Portland 2022. Um, my name is Mindy League. I'm the UX Director with Elevated Third. And Elevated Third is a digital marketing agency specializing in enterprise with Drupal. And what that means is we utilize open source technologies to better work with partners and marketing platforms to deliver results for our B2B clients. Speaking of B2B clients, we're here today with one of our clients that we worked with for a, implement a uh, personalization strategy. This is Catherine Bowler with Comcast Technology Solutions. Thanks for joining us. Of course, thanks for having me and good morning everyone. I am Digital Marketing Director at Comcast Technology Solutions. And let's see, I've been there about eight years now. I really had the opportunity to build both the digital strategy and the digital team from the ground up. Um, and yeah, excited to talk about how Elevated Third and I partnered on a personalization strategy and some of the learnings and findings we've had today. Yeah, awesome. So this is a fireside chat. So we decided to take the slides down get comfortable and just have a little conversation. So we're going to be asking questions uh, with Catherine. We have some pre-formulated thoughts that we wanted to share with you. And then at the end, we'll have open time for Q&A. So um, we are going to get started asking about the approach that um, really, first of all, I want to ask, what is Comcast Technology Solutions? How is that different than Comcast? And tell us a bit about uh, your history with uh, Drupal. Yeah, so Comcast Technology Solutions, or CTS, we are a B2B division of Comcast Cable, and we have four internal business lines that serve five markets. And what we do is essentially take the technologies that Comcast, NBC Universal, and Sky builds for itself and bring it to market for others. So a good example, if you're familiar with the Xfinity brand, um, we white label the X1 platform and resell to other global cable operators. Um, and we've been with Drupal, gosh, as long as I've been with Comcast, we've built websites and uh, portals on the Drupal platform. Excellent, so this is your first DrupalCon, so yes. you're experiencing the Drupal community, and how's that experience been with uh, open source? How's that benefited? Yeah, so Comcast as a whole really leans into open source technology. Um, it's something that we believe makes our products better, makes our customer experience better, and it really helps to attract the right kind of talent for Comcast too. And bringing it down to the CTS level, I've seen a lot of benefits as far as agility, flexibility, and just the speed at which we're able to solve co complex problems. So it's been great leaning into that kind of collective development ethos. Yeah, that's awesome. We'd love to hear that. How did you know that CTS was ready to move into personalization for your marketing program? Yeah, so CTS, since we're a B2B organization, it really followed fast behind an account-based marketing strategy. So once we realized, you know, we know who we want to go after, we want to go after companies that look a lot like us, they'd be a good fit for the technology, um, have the same sort of pain points, um, it really helped to just step into personalization next. And the fact that we have different business lines, different markets, and a whole host of solutions, it really, it made sense to personalize that experience so it's not overwhelming as customers and prospects come to our website and try to figure out how we can help them. Yeah, that's a great takeaway that you can't be, serve everyone on with all those business lines. How about, um, any advice you have for organizations or people here that are just wanting to get started with personalization? Yeah, um, a lot probably. I could probably talk about that the whole time. Um, but some major themes to it, I think, are taking a look at the data. So from two perspectives, both what you have to work off of as far as your customer and prospect data, making sure it's something that is dynamic, is maintained, um, and really something you can activate in a meaningful way. Um, and also the data on the results side. So for us, it was a little bit of a bolt on after we had started running personalization where we realized, you know, we have a good view into our channels and some of those experiences, but it was hard to, to merge the two together and really determine how can we be proactive in our maintenance. So um, the data is really important. 
Uh, another huge learning I would say is when it comes to when you're starting, it's super overwhelming to think about all the ways you can personalize for everyone, but don't let it overwhelm you. Start small and really be thoughtful and intentional about the way you're going uh, to market with personalization and use that to drive further ideas, improvements, um, again, leaning into that data to find out what exactly is driving impact for your customers or your prospects. Yeah, that's good advice. Think with the end result first and then work backwards. So how about Drupal? Can you tell us how that fits into your MarTech stack? Yeah, so Drupal, I, I would say, is probably a very key piece to the technologies we use. Um, it allows us to be agnostic about what ABM platforms you can tie into it. It's something that, especially using smart content, you can lean into a lot of other options. And we've pivoted. We've had um, a couple of different ABM platforms we've used over the years. Uh, we have uh, you know, a whole host of other integrations that we've added. And Drupal has really proven to be a flexible back end for us. So, I mean, it's, it's absolutely key. It also allows you to kind of decouple ABM and personalization. So a lot of ABM platforms, they have their own personalization solution. And that could be a great way to start, especially if you're still working on the back end and what exactly you want to integrate and how you want to put that tech stack together. But for us, it was a, not a long-term play because we see, you know, it fits in ABM and that's kind of where we're at now, but we're starting to shift over to how do you take that into a full CTS-wide experience? So not just for your target list, not just for the companies you know you're going after, but any user that comes to your website. So Drupal has been key for that. Yeah, it sounds like it. And you mentioned all the business lines, all the different segments you had to build, like how we're trying to stand up to all that. What about for your goals within your organization? How, what matters the most to CTS when it comes to your go-to market personalization strategy? Yeah, that's um, a good question. I would say, in general, I mean, every, every business is motivated by the ROI and the revenue you bring in, um, which makes personalization kind of a tricky thing to nail down because it's not something that you can say, well, I personalized that experience and that drove this opportunity and this revenue that came in as a result. Because you don't know, you know if that's what did it or how, you know, how it came together. Um, and for our business lines too, there's, there's little different pieces of it that matter to them as well from um, looking at the where they are in their stage of business. So we have some business lines that are more about growth. They're bringing in the net new companies, they want to land new accounts, get into new verticals. Um, and then on the flip side, we have ones that are more mature. So it's really about how do I retain the customers I have, make sure they're going to sign that renewal and stick with us. Um, so personalization has a play in both of those. Um, when it comes to those net new accounts, we can use a combination of that targeted ad serving, bring people in, serve them a great customer experience, showing them why we'd be a good partner for them. Um, and we can activate that in a meaningful way through intent that we can surface um, on or off site, um, different signals that they have or that the sales team may loop us in on to know, hey, now's a good time to put this call to action in front of them and see if they bite. Um, and when it comes to the mature business lines, personalization also has a play there um, in looking at intent as well because they have you know, we can look at competitors. When are they looking at our competitor websites or researching products that um, may be competing with ours? And they're up for renewal. Um, we actually had a, a good kind of internal case study on that front where um, a client, a content provider, one of the major content providers was actually in a dispute with Comcast on the cable side. And so it did trickle down where there were flight risks, the renewal was up. Um, we surfed with some intent. We're able to activate a personalized experience that our sales team or account team could send over and have them come on our site and remind them why they partner with us and how we customize their solution. So there's a whole host of ways um, you can use it on all sorts of businesses. Can you tell us what technology you are using to help understand their intent? Yeah, so... We, since we have so many different business lines, a whole bunch of products, 
uh, we really need a broad solution when it comes to intent. So that's something we do right now through the demand-based ABM platform. Um, we can set up you know, different keyword groups, uh, different topics, um, have some based on competitors, some based on our own product lines. It's really flexible. So it's been a good, a good solution for us so far. And so Elevated Third help integrate that with our smart content right. module. Right, right, so right. little plug there that we were able to work <laughs> with demand base that we're, we are already capturing intent and user behaviors to yeah. help personalize for them. Yeah, and so it made it really seamless to be able to activate it um, in the back end of our site so easily. Awesome, great. Well, can you share learnings, things that you would have done different or how you might uh, next time you yeah. roll out a personalization <laughs> strategy? Um, yes, definitely some learnings. I, t I touched on some of the data earlier, but um, in addition to that, I think don't, the big thing for us was like not biting off more than you can chew or not starting to do too much too fast. So we really started with um, a brand campaign. It was within the marketing department. We had control over it. Didn't have to rally um, the buy-in from the businesses quite yet and use that as our case study. Um, and then from there, we actually probably went a little too deep. So our advertising suite who they sell um, a product that Comcast developed internally to route linear TV ads and manage it. And then we took it, expanded it to digital destinations and took it to market. Um, and our ad team, they're going after several different verticals. And we went a little wild with our first personalization project with them. Um, not only did we personalize based on verticals, but then we're like going into the sub categories of those verticals. So. For example, we had quick service restaurants as one of our verticals. We had seven different creatives for that one segment of their market. And it was way too much, way too fast. And we sunk hours into it that probably didn't need to be. Um, we probably could have driven the same results without having that much. Um, and we did it with other verticals as well. So that was a, that was a huge learning was do not jump in all at once. Be intentional look at the data and activate what is driving impact. Um, and maybe going down to the QSRs, you know, the quick service restaurants, we didn't need to do a chicken version and a hamburger version and a, you know, a pizza version. It was, it was kind of out of control. That's funny. So, um, so then that segmentation was a little too much. So can you explain your, your revised approach to segmentation? How did you think about your audiences from there? Yeah. So, um, overall at CTS, obviously the, Different markets we serve is an easy way to segment. Um, the other way that we could activate a lot was based on where they're at in that customer journey. So with our target list and the people we're going at or the companies we're going after, it is a host of upsells within current customers to completely net new accounts. Um, so that was just a, a good way to, to do it. Um, and we started expanding our approach a little differently when you think about the size of the audience too. So we started with that one to few or a target list where we had, you know, a couple hundred per business line that we're really focused on and serving ads to and driving those personalized experiences. And now we're kind of going both ways. So the digital team is going out a little bit, seeing what's working that we can expand to those broader customer segments and starting to bring in some, you know, maybe lookalike audiences that might be just as valuable as the target list ones. Um, and then we also have our marketing team going more narrow. So down to that one-to-one -one ABM approach. So really sitting down with sales saying, what are their top 10 accounts that you want to land this year? How can we help you? And there, you're able to activate a lot more. You're able to look at, okay, what personas are missing from this buying committee? You have a tighter feedback loop from sales, so you have a lot more to action. Um, and we're just getting started with that, so I don't have a lot of insights there quite yet, um, but that's kind of the way we're approaching it now. Okay, so it's, it's evolving. Can you tell us about the content requirements as you thought about your campaigns and how did you tailor those messages? Yeah, so this is, um, I think, something that can feel overwhelming for content marketing teams, thinking about, oh, if I'm going to start personalizing this content, I am exponentially increasing what I'm, what I'm going to have to put together and what I'm going to have to activate. 
Um, it's We have a small content team internally. Um, there's just a couple of people. We have two writers. Um, so we can't spend all the time hitting every single piece of content we want. We really have to prioritize what we, what we do. Um, and one way we found success there is to start with a core piece of content, see how you can repurpose it for different personas, different formats, um, how you can start to change it too based on where they are in the journey. So maybe something that's more of a research paper would be that top, top of funnel kind of piquing the interest. But then how do you draw that down to um, bringing someone in for a sales conversation? So I don't know that we have it totally nailed yet, but the content marketing team has been uh, a great partner to have in the personalization space. And yeah, we'll just keep going from there. Yeah. So, but you started with a, a framework, like a content strategy. Oh yes. Framework. Yeah. So this was one that actually started with Elevated Third years ago. Um, we defined our personas. We started putting together the content calendar and how you can start to plan out um, pieces that are thoughtful and intentional as far as reaching the right folks, the right personas, the right top of funnel, mid funnel, et cetera. So that was a, a good place to start is to kind of define that calendar. Excellent. Plan to have a plan. Yep. <laughs> so with my background in UX, I'm particularly interested in personas and how you use those within your marketing strategy. How have those changed since you started using them? Yeah. Um, yeah. Personas have uh, definitely changed a lot. And I think that was something that initially when you're kind of thinking about it, it's like you're checking the box. I'm going to name the personas that we want to go after. And now that I have them defined, great, we can start using that as the framework moving forward. Um, we've discovered that it has to be living and breathing. The, times change, especially with COVID, right? The different pain points came out. Um, our products change. The world changes. It's all, you know, you have to take all that into account. Um, we also realized you don't need to name them the cutesy names. Uh, sales Joan does not Bob. care. <laughs> they don't. They don't know what you're talking about when you have the Baron and the you know the nice names that maybe you like as a marketer. Um, it did not translate well into alignment with sales. So uh, we went back to the you know, boring old names like this is a tech persona. There's a business persona, mm -hmm. um, and really having to refresh those pain points under each and the way you message them has to be done on a calendar. So I would say on a, probably a, at least a half year basis, we've been going back and looking at them and revising uh, and categorizing our content against them too and starting to see, okay, well, this one changed, the pain points change. Now here's the content that aligns with that. Let's go back and take a look at that and see if there's any tweaks we can make to make it more valuable going forward. Awesome. So now how did you rally all your teams, the disparate groups that you have there to get them uh, going with this personalization strategy and this shift in, in your go to market? Yeah, um, I would say that's still a work in progress it, or it's like always a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, it is it comes off as extra work to create these personalized experiences. So you have to make it easy for everyone. Um, one way we kind of prove the value of it too is starting with a you know a first case study a first personalized experience the low-hanging fruit um, which for us was a brand campaign where we message differently to different markets um, and then from there we started taking a look at our home page our front page of our site how can we use personalization there and we really took the chance to take that hero image and use it for various targets or different target lists and show them what should matter most to them or what we think would align with them the most. Um, and it really helped rally, I think, some of our teams. So one of our products is our voice suite and we had a fraud mitigation service launch. Well, they only have a couple dozen targets, which is maybe 2% of our entire target list. But by putting that front and center for those targets on our homepage, we drove more than 100 visits to that um, that service, that landing page from those companies. So just small things like that can start driving results. And you'll start to have those conversations with the different teams that are involved. And sh you know, evangelize it. Share the wins. Awesome. 
I know you mentioned COVID earlier, and I, I, I know that you rolled out this personalization strategy right amid the pandemic. How did that change what you were planning to do? Yeah, <laughs> COVID was a big, uh, a big shift, a big test of being agile too. Um, with the onset of COVID, my team, the digital team, automatically had a lot more on our plate. Everything was going virtual. Uh, there was a lot more. It felt, it felt a little overwhelming at first. Um, and so we had this plan to launch our brand campaign with the personalized experiences based on market. And of course, COVID hit. There goes our IP address tracking. No way we can activate on that. Um, the good thing was, since we have smart content, it was actually a pretty easy pivot. We're able to instead be really targeted at the upfront of the ads and who we're serving them to making sure they're in the right markets and using those UTM parameters on the links to activate the right experience. So um, we were lucky in that we had that flexibility because had we been baked into an ABM platform, I don't know if we would have been able to uh, prove any success or any lift there. Yeah, a lot changed, <laughs> a lot changed during that time. Everyone had to pivot quick. So yeah. um, tell us about your personalization journey, just what that was like for CTS. Yeah, um, <laughs> I would say our journey was messy. It's not one of those, you know, very linear processes where you can kind of look at, oh, yeah, we're ramping and um, you know exactly where you're going and how we're getting there. Um, it's proven, obviously, with COVID coming in, that was a huge shift. Um, we, we started small with what we could control. Like I said, we did that brand campaign. We started with the front door of our website. Um, built the internal momentum around it. Um, and then even before that, I guess, you know, we were building the tech stack out um, at least a year ahead of that. So it was kind of a slow thing. There were steps forward, there were steps backwards, and it wasn't an easy, uh, an easy thing to progress. I guess looking back on it too now, you know, so at the end of last year, we rolled out a framework that I think would have been helpful earlier in the process where it's more of a consultative approach. So now we sit down with our business or sit down with our marketing manager with that business and we have questions and then we start to define what are the segments based on what could be most impactful, define goals against each segment and then launch a campaign. And then after that, you can take a look back and see, am I meeting those benchmarks, those goals? Uh, but we didn't start that way. We started a little messy, um, and we just tried to try to get it, some momentum going, and really just kind of evangelized it. You mentioned you're setting goals with your business lines. How do you measure the success? How do you understand that? And recommendations for how to look at KPIs and metrics. Yeah, this is a this is a tough question. <laughs> I don't think I have it totally nailed yet either. So. We have, obviously, you know, what matters to our businesses is revenue, but we also don't have the adoption of using our CRM, our sales force, to track all that revenue. Our sales teams are not paid on commission based on what's in our systems. So that makes it difficult to get to the ROI, to get to the revenue behind our efforts. Um, so we really have to rely for, on more of those metrics that go up the funnel from there. So we're looking at things like, how are we engaging our target list or our customer segments? How are we converting them? What percentage are engaged? How many of those convert? And then from there, what are the marketing qualified leads and accounts? And what does sales accept and start to progress for more opportunities? So I can say by looking at what we've improved from a personalization standpoint, we're engaging them more. And from there, that, that trickle down the funnel, those uh, percentage that move from one step to the next is not decreasing, it's actually improving. So I know we're driving more, but I don't have the revenue behind it yet. So it's kind of a work in progress. And it's, sometimes it's kind of hard to, to get the buy-in, but you know, we work with what we can do. So we, are, we can share successes beyond that. So how are you looking at your analytics? So, and what, I, mean, I, know we, I think we helped you guys set up some data dashboards, yeah. some data studio uh, dashboards, but that's helping you understand the increased engagement, like time on yeah. site or bounce rates, or what, what are the key metrics? 
Yeah, so it's elevated there is definitely a help um, to set up more event based tracking around our personalization efforts so we can look at both the channels and the experiences together. Um, and actually, it's driven, it's allowed us to do a lot of optimization. So originally, when you're looking at the personalized experience and analytics, we could see like, hey, this isn't, you know, we're seeing a high bounce right here. But then when we started to combine the channels with what we're seeing in the experiences, um, it was one channel that we realized, okay, this programmatic channel isn't reaching the right people. This isn't driving impactful traffic. So once we took that out, you could actually see a lift there. Um, and with that too, I think we've, with our brand campaign, that was a big, a big uh, success for us. That was our first one. And we saw a 30% lift on time on site. So people were engaging more. We also saw a lift on pages per session. So they were actually clicking around and exploring like we wanted them to do. They're following that journey, um, which was a huge win. Yeah, so you're able to fine tune what was on your channels and see what's working and what's yeah. not working. Yeah. That's great. Awesome. Any other metrics or any other uh, results that you can share with us? Um, I'd not, I don't have specific uh, conversion rates available, but I know we reestablished um, an increase in conversion rates for a couple of our growth business lines, which was awesome to see. It went up, I don't want to guess on that. I want to say 40% yeah, from are, what we saw before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was an, a big enough lift that we were, we were uh, very happy about it. Now, if we can just tie all those numbers to revenue, then we'd have like a clear picture. Yes. But, you know, we're <laughs> That's the long-term goal. We are working through this whole personalization effort as well as, uh, I mean, other things that were happening in our business lines as far as the sales teams being siloed has kind of spurred a master data management strategy. So now we're we're digging into it with representatives across our organization, all of our business lines, to bring all of our product systems into one view together. And I know it'll be a very, very slow process. We're starting with a pilot this year, um, but I'm really excited for that because I think that'll open up a lot more that we can do from a personalization standpoint. Yeah, because these types of strategies really do involve everyone from all the different departments and business lines to get involved and yeah. rally behind it. And so evangelizing it early is really important. Keeping the momentum, sharing out what you're doing, keep yeah. that going. So we're really glad you were here today to share with us your direct insight and experience with rolling it out, how you did that, seeing just under the hood on how that experience has been for you, working with smart content, working with Drupal and the community. We're glad you were here. Thank you. For yeah. Sharing. Thanks for inviting me. And it's great to see um, everyone involved with it and kind of peek behind the curtains. Because I, like I said, I've never been here before. I've never uh, gone to a Drupal conference. So it's it's awesome to be a part of it. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions or anything you want to ask? Yes, for using demand base. Yep. Um, we so there are some functionalities behind it within demand base that we tap into from a lookalike audience standpoint, from um, uh, building out what you know intent triggered type of uh, pieces of it. Does that answer the question a little bit? Oh, yeah. So, okay. Choosing demand base over the Adobe solution. I gotcha. You know, it's... I don't know if I have a necessarily a straightforward answer with that. It's kind of hard within Comcast. They have, um, we have so many different divisions. We don't always talk to each other or collaborate. Um, demand base is one though that we did. We worked with the Comcast business side of the house. So they were also um, doing a trial at the same time we were back in 2017. Um, we, we both saw success from it from a B2B perspective where I think Xfinity, it's more the, it is the B2C side of the house. So 
um, we didn't necessarily collaborate with them, but um, that's a good insight that you kind of checked out the site and had. I mean, that's a great question to ask. Right. Well, I know we're constantly comparing the new technologies that are out there, and there's a lot of competitors, you know, in the landscape. And so sometimes we have to choose what it is that the clients or the organizations we're working with have in place or have available. Um, but we try to just select what is available at that time, what they're familiar with, what makes the most sense. And also through using smart content, we already have existing API that works with that platform. And so it really made a lot of sense for this particular initiative. Yeah, and, and to add to that too, we have used different ABM platforms as well. Demand-based is the one we're using now, but um, there were others that we have tried out. Um, I do think that flexibility in the tightest of smart content was a huge plus, and that team at Demandbase was willing to work with us on that as far as making sure everything was connecting well. Um, so that was definitely something that drove a plus. The other part of it too that to me was a big selling point was the breadth of what you could do from an intent standpoint. So um, you can have as many topics, many groups of keywords that you want to track. And when you're doing something for four business lines, five markets, and there's you know eight to 10 products under each of those, it, it gets really big really fast. So it's proven to be easy for us to organize, um, which is a huge plus. And, it, and it's baked right into Salesforce, which is our CRM system. So that made it a lot easier as far as that sales connection. Yeah, and that's one thing we had talked about earlier was how did you select that, that tech stack? There was a kind of process of elimination. There are limitations in other tools that we were disqualified because, like she mentioned, so many business lines, so many keywords, just the magnitude of their program just pushed them into some particular tools and then made yeah. that selection from that. Excuse me? What do we use for the data storage, or where is the content being stored? Um, I think we're using you know, the Drupal interface smart content module is right there within the CMS for you to be able to load in your content. So are you using any RAM, like content hub or something? Yeah, not in this case. There's not, but mm -hmm. potentially if it needed to have a dam, I think that could be something on a not on this project. We're not doing that. Yeah, that can be very useful when you're able to do that. Yeah, Jeff? I think the, the philosophy is different for B2B, whereas the Adobe target is B2C, so you have a huge aggregate of anonymous traffic, right. versus in B2B, you know your accounts are in. Mm -hmm. We have, yeah, we have like um, 1,200, 1,300 targets. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're probably 18 months to two years. Right. Yeah, so personalization was the next step in their account-based marketing program, the ABM of their targets, of their specific you know, company accounts. So that was just that, that scenario lended itself to the, that platform, yeah. Yeah, any other questions? Anyone else? Awesome, well, we're glad you joined us this morning. A little uh, chat with uh, Catherine, so thanks for coming. Enjoy the rest of your DrupalCon. It's the last like day here, I guess, then tomorrow's mm -hmm. contribution day. So enjoy your time. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, guys.